if you don't mind. Um, thank you for the panel and the members to be here. Uh, if you all, I know it's on your agenda, it showed uh, Payments 101 first. We have a quick little resolution we want to get through. And if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, ask Dante Handel to come up with ACCG. Dante, if you'll come up and just take a mic, whichever one you want to get up here. Just grab one of these first mics here. Number three, number three there. Okay, witness number three, you're on trial. Um, <laughs> What we want to do is, last time we presented this bill uh, to the panel, if any of you all were not here, is basically this bill was presented and there were some questions regarding someone gaming the system. And obviously we don't want anybody gaming the system. So uh, Dante did some, a lot of due diligence and he went back and he worked with ACCG and several other outfits to figure out how and the tax commissioners, you know, not to game the system. You got me a sign-up sheet too. That, sir, uh, sign-up sheet. And we got a, uh, I, I, I'm, delighted to tell you we have a, a tax commissioner here with us right now and um, we want to uh, uh, get, get Kevin up here Kevin can you come on up too if you don't mind since you're an actually you, you do this stuff okay we just confuse your world with laws right I wouldn't say that okay that's that was, that was a great answer by the way <laughs> That's a good answer. Anyway, the guys, what happened was is, is to keep from gaming the system, if you all look on your talking highlight, on the highlight sheet, the little sheet he drafted out for us, it just says SR82 highlights, and we are working off the same uh, LC432668S. So that's what we're working off of. Everybody got those on the highlights? If you look down at the bottom, the last, the next to the last two, basically it's what the change was. And I like to reiterate that this is done to keep anybody from gaining the system. And basically, Dante, if you will, go from that right there on the owner of record, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so if you were to look at line 54 of the bills, that's subparagraph 3B, that's where we've added the language that the owner of record and any person having record title or interest in or lien upon a property sold under this paragraph. And that's the language pulled out of the right of redemption statute, which is in 48-4-40. Um, so anyone who has that interest in the property is only authorized to bid the amount of taxes owed at that waiver sale. So they can't bid less than what they were supposed to pay in the first place. So that, that should cover any game into the system on a waiver sale. Then if the property was sold at a waiver sale and one of those owners or someone else with interest tried to exercise the right of redemption, they would pay to the purchaser from the waiver sale what that person paid at the sale plus 20 percent same as it currently is now and any taxes that were waived automatically reattached to the property as a lien so that should prevent any potential gaming of the system uh, through the right of redemption process how I want to handle it, but I want to, uh, I may refer to my vice chair to make sure I pro tem here. I think it takes six of us to have a quorum here. And right now I'm, I'm counting them. I think I keep running up short with one person. Um, we could vote to amend the rules and do it with five if you all so desire. I do believe that's, that's possible. I have to go back and check on the, the language of that. So we just don't have that quorum yet. And, and Miss Emily's trying to get our other person. The, the problem is, guys, we've got so many meetings going on that we everybody's in a meeting. Yeah. Uh, we got Tanya is on it, Sonia, Emmanuel, Brian, and Miss Tate. Yeah, the, uh, we can't do it, that's right. I didn't think we could, yeah. And we really can't vote on it. We will um, put you on hold if you don't mind, guys. Uh, and, and anyway, did you did you want to say anything about how this rule would affect you, just to make sure we have it for the record? While you're there. Well, I, would, I just wanted to answer any questions if they came up, and just want to tell you that from the tax commissioner's perspective, um, this may be the only way that we get some of these abandoned, dilapidated, derelict properties back to useful, productive use. Right. So, uh, so I'm in support of this bill, and so I hope it does pass. Come I on. haven't had any commissioners that's called me yet, or tax collectors said they hadn't done support this. And I appreciate you coming and making the trip, but I wish we could give you a vote. But if you'll hang on, we'll put you on hold. We may get a quorum after a while. Sir. If you guys don't mind. Yes, sir. Excuse me, got one question. One number <clears throat> five. What are you? Go. Um, 
the uh, pun written approval of city governing authority um, tax commissioner um, the, the structure to approve this to go forward to have this relief of taxes um, uh, that, that are owed the, where in here is the approval of this, the commissioners is, is, is the board of commissioners but by, by, a, by a vote of majority of the commissioners how does that structure work and it, do they approve anything that sells or do they approve a specific amount that's going to be reduced they would they would uh, approve of the particular parcel to be sold for less than the normal opening bid um, normally we do not have to go through that process on a regular tax sale we just if we have a lien if they're delinquent we can take them to tax sale of course in this law we have to take it to tax sale twice it takes about four months from beginning to end with tax sale. So you're talking about doing that twice. If it doesn't sell, then we go to the city, county, governing authority, get approval for that parcel to sell for less than owed, and then we go through the four-month process again. So this would be the third tax sale that we would. We and would and when they approve, do they approve that anything up to all the taxes could be relieved? Do they approve a certain amount? How does that? So it's just the taxes and penalty and interest that can be reduced. The hard cost to take it to tax sure, sale, sure. advertising, levy cost, or have to be included in the opening bid. To be just, just as a matter of convention, and forgive me, I don't, I don't know how this, this works, they would be approving all the tax to be removed or up to the, the, the full amount of the tax to be, to, to be relieved? What, what, what does that look like when they take action? So as it's worded now, they'd have the ability to waive up to 100% of the tax. So could land anywhere in between there. Based on the bid? Uh, based on the resolution. Based on the resolution. So they could say okay. they want to waive half the taxes, for okay. example. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so they're not, they're not going to find out when the bids come in what they waive. They're going to know going in what they're, where they're going to waive in advance. Right. Okay. And, and to reiterate what you just said, it's a per parcel basis. No matter if you got 50 in your community, you have to be taken up one at a time. That's correct. Yeah, for sure. uh, welcome, Senator Sign. Is that welcome? That's all right. We uh, we were short a quorum. If you don't mind, I don't know how you feel about it, but I want you to know we put the uh, highlights in there, and the highlights basically uh, covered what the questions you and um, uh, Senator Jones had at the last meeting. We've covered that. We should be good to go. And uh, I'd like to move this bill forward. They want to get it moving, so I'll entertain a motion and see where we are. Have a motion from Senator Dixon to do pass. I have a second from Senator Hodges to do pass. Uh, you need time, Ms. Tanya? Oh, yeah. You okay? Not, yeah. we, we covered all your, your questions. So we have a motion to do pass and a second to do pass. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Motion carried unanimously. We'll move it to rules. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank guy. You. And thank you for coming down, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll talk. Is it you guys that still want to do your thing? I mean, you hadn't changed your mind, have you? My Lord, we were hoping so. It's the last day. It? <laughs> Payments 101. Come on up to the table, guys. I'm going to have to let you guys sort of introduce yourself as you go along if you don't mind. I got three mics on right there. <laughs> you want to present for the podium, sir? Good? Oh, okay. We're good. Okay, I, I know we're short on time, so I'll... Oh, well... Um, I'll just stick to the script from my guy over here. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman uh, and the Senate uh, Banking and Financial Institutions Committee. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Wes Richards. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the American Transaction Processors Coalition. Uh, we're a national trade association uh, representing the payment processing industry. Uh, we were founded in 2014 and are headquartered in Atlanta in the heart of Transaction Alley. Uh, Transaction Alley is a term that we coined for the area in and around Atlanta, uh, which has the highest concentration of payment processing companies in the world. Over 70% of all U.S. transactions are processed by companies here in Georgia. The purpose of the ATPC is to raise awareness about this critical part of the financial services industry uh, and to be a resource for policymakers 
on issues relating to the industry. Uh, we're here today to present, um, present to you about the payments ecosystem, uh, highlighting who the key players are and how they interact with one another and how this industry supports the U.S. global economy. Our speakers today include Tom Bell, who's the CEO of MAST and is the Executive Director of Payments for Synovus Bank, Jeremy Bankson, Senior Vice President and Chief Credit Officer of FIS, one of the world's largest fintechs, Patrick Dwyer, Vice President of Public Policy, Head of U.S. State Affairs for MasterCard, and Josh Mumo, who's Head of Government Services for SpeedChain. Each of these individuals represent a unique piece of the payments industry. Our hope is that this briefing will give you a better understanding of the significance of the industry in Georgia. And with that, I will turn it over to our panel of experts. Do you want to go first on Witness M1? Uh, one, yes. Please state your name again, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, good afternoon. I'm Tom Bell. Put it to you. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Bell, and I'm the Executive Director of Payments at Synovus Bank, um, headquartered in Columbus, Georgia. Um, what I was hoping to do was to give a little bit of context in terms of the role of financial institutions um, in, uh, you know, the whole payment uh, ecosystem. But before I do that, I would do want to um, give a little brief on Synovus Bank. If if hopefully everybody's familiar with Synovus Bank, but Synovus Bank is a 134-year-old bank formed in Columbus, Georgia, and it is Georgia's largest headquartered bank. Um, like I said, it was started 134 years ago by what we call a simple act of kindness, where a mill operator in uh, Columbus, Georgia, agreed to start basically keeping the savings of the employees in the, in the mill safe because they were not, they were putting it in the, their mattress or wherever. So simple act of kindness that actually resulted in what is now Synovus Bank. Um, 60 billion in assets, 246 branches across the five state region, and um, obviously a number of awards that Synovus has won in terms of a great place to work, et cetera. So Synovus Bank, as I said, Georgia's largest uh, bank. So, and when it comes to financial institutions and the role in the payment ecosystem, probably helpful to start with kind of the, if you will, the flow of how payments happen. So first of all, as you can see in the chart here, consumer makes the transaction at a merchant, which we're all familiar with, you know, as consumers. That merchant submits the transaction in through a series of gateways and other things through the acquiring banks. The acquiring bank sends that through to the card networks which ultimately goes to the issuers, meaning the, you know, the bank that actually issued the card. Approval or denial comes back through. Um, funds ultimately get to the merchant and they are settled on a nightly basis. And this is something that happens, and in, 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 in a gentleman from FIS and MasterCard will talk about it, this happens millions and millions of times a second um, across the world. So this is a tried and true um, network, if you will, that exists uh, today. The role of Synovus in this process is threefold. First of all, Synovus um, is actually a merchant acquirer. So we actually sell the service to small businesses, large businesses to help them accept credit card transactions. Um, we're actually what's called a sponsor bank. So we enable companies like FIS and others to also acquire transactions. And Synovus is an issuer of credit cards. So we issue consumer uh, small business, large business credit cards. So Synovus plays all the way across this ecosystem. Synovus has been in the sponsorship business, for example, for over 20 years, enabling, um, enabling this process. What many people don't know, if you know, um, uh, you know the history of payment payments in uh, Georgia, uh, a company called Total Systems, TSIS, out of Georgia, was actually founded by Synovus Bank or Columbus Bank and Trust at the time and then ultimately was spun off. So Synovus has been involved in payments throughout the history of the growth of payments and we're certainly proud to be part of uh, what is now the largest uh, I think payments ecosystem in the world here in Georgia. So I'll now pass it off to Jeremy. Yeah. I'll try. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can hit the... Sorry. I'll let you yeah, go. no problem. Thank you. Um, so Jeremy Bankson, um, I might be hitting the wrong button. 
Oh, okay. Uh, Jeremy Banks and I'm here with FIS. So FIS is a very large payment uh, payment provider, but also a bank technology provider. So we have a significant amount of technology solutions that we provide um, to financial institutions. Um, and then in the payment space, FIS owns WorldPay. Um, so WorldPay is, um, you know, really one of the largest providers of merchant services. Um, let's see if we can flip to the next page here very simple terms we provide the solutions to businesses to be able to accept payments from their customers whether they're consumers or business to business um, and we support um, you know all all shapes and sizes of merchants across industries from the SMBs to the largest um, largest national international corporations and we have uh, many different uh, solutions on our platforms to be able to do that on, um, you know, the environment that the merchant's operating. So whether they're retail or online or embedded payments or wherever. So we have significant technology that provides all of those solutions for the businesses to be able to take those payments. Um, we are global. Uh, most of our business is in the U.S. and the U.K., but we also um, operate in APAC, Latin America, other parts of Europe and Africa as well. Um, so uh, I'll flip us to the next page and just give some, um, some stats. Uh, WorldPay processed last year on behalf of its uh, merchant customers over $2 trillion in payments volume across uh, 1 million merchant locations. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, we process uh, 100 and over 110 million individual payment transactions for those businesses. Um, so it's a really significant uh, amount of volume that uh, we process through our systems. From a transactional perspective, we're, we're globally the largest provider of merchant services. Um, I do have a... Uh, sort of a, a simplified ecosystem chart with the green box around um, around the world pay uh, area right next to the merchant um, every merchant needs a provider in order to access this ecosystem to accept payments uh, and so that's really where we sit so uh, any type of payments whether it's credit debit or what have you flows through our systems um, but our larger company is also uh, in other places, such as FIS as an issuer processor. So that's, um, that's sort of where we sit in the ecosystem. And thank you very much for your time today. I'll turn it to Patrick next. Thank you. Yep, good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for uh, having us uh, up at this uh, this panel, I, hopefully, it's, um, it will kind of address some of the questions and some of the, the role of the different players. So, if we could, I'm sorry, if we could switch to this. So, you know, the, the you know, Mastercard, you know, the role uh, that the card networks play. You know, that we you know, we are also trying to get away from the card, even though we have it in our name. Um, you know, in the, if you think about payments, you know, our our role is bringing these uh, these customers together. Now, our customers are the people at this table, the financial institutions, the ones that issue the cards, and the ones that. Uh, sign up the merchants to take them. We don't. We don't wor work directly with consumers. We're not a. We're a B two B company. You know, we have a very large marketing campaign that would make you think otherwise. But uh, our core business is dealing with with uh, financial institutions on both sides of the transaction. And we um, we talk about that. That's the the acquiring banks. Um, you know, FIS is you know is represents part of that, and then Synovus is an example of of a, uh, a card issuing institutions. But we do business you know around the world. We've got over you know 25,000 banks that we do business with globally. Um, you know, eight to nine million merchants are, are part of our system. You know, a couple you know a couple stats about the the amount of transactions that flow through our system, the amount of dollars that go through it. But I think you know the core of it is sort of what you know wh what we what role do we play in doing that and making these transactions work. One of the things we do is we provide a level playing field for the participants to, to gauge their risks. The, the banks uh, don't have relationships directly with the merchants, you know, but how do you gauge those risks for those transactions? And that's what the networks provide. They provide a framework in order to sort of um, actualize that that risk calculation so they can they feel comfortable in accepting transactions from 
from you know millions of different merchants around the world that they have no rela direct relationship with her. You know, through our standards, through our rules, we allow these transactions um, to flow through, and there's and there's confidence on both sides of the transactions that there'll be a uh, you know there'll be a uh, a resolution if there's a dispute, but also that there's certainty in cost. Uh, you know, for for those transactions for every every. Uh, provider in the system. So again, you know, we look at this, we call this sort of the, the four-party model is what we are. Visa is a very much same uh, structure-wise where you know, the, the, we, we don't, again, have the relationship with the merchant or the ca account holder, the card issuer, but the acquirer and the issuer are our core services. We provide those services that was mentioned earlier, the, the you know, the authorizations, the switching and the settlement so that the allowing that transaction to flow through the system, but also making sure that the, the um, entities in that system are made whole uh, on sort of a net basis uh, at, you know, in, uh, in the clearing and settlement process. And on top of that, we add, we add in our own value-added services, which are predominantly on the, on the fraud and security side, making sure, you know, our whole system is based on understanding that we are, you know, we are a trusted partner for, in both, uh, for both these entities and, and, you know, making sure that we play our role, make sure that, that, that uh, those transactions are, are um, you know, f uh, address sort of fraud concerns, but also that if there is any sort of concern that there's a mechanism to reward that. So, so that's one of the main ways that we, you know, we provide value in this, you know, both from a, uh, from a rules perspective and from a, a setting a, a level playing field for, for entities on both sides of transactions. So, um, you know, how this plays out, you know, concretely is if you think about, you know, what, what we provide is if individual financial institutions had to go out and build these relationships with merchants, you know, you're, you're looking at sort of the, the left-hand side here, uh, you know th that's that's what we solve for. We, we by putting ourselves in the middle and providing sort of a level playing field, in you know in the ecosystem, we allow those those uh, merchants in their acquiring banks and those issuing banks, you know, to have sort of a steady stream of commerce globally, seamlessly, if you will, uh, you know, w with the certainty that they'll be you know their uh, their risk will be uh, adjudicated if necessary, but also they understand who they're doing business with, and if they're doing business. With an entity in our system, they've got uh, you know they've got some certainty about how that works. So so that's at the core of it, really. What the, what the networks provide is that certainty in the transactions, is that transparency uh, across all the parties that are involved in order that for those transactions to uh, to be safely and securely transacted um, at a global level. So so that's really the the, the the core of the business. So happy to answer any questions, uh, but I'll turn it over to to uh, Josh. <clears throat> I'll wait till that one comes up. So I'm Josh Mumal with Speedchain. Uh, Speedchain is a fintech startup. Um, we're actually focused in the private and public sector. Um, but before I get into the presentation, I, I would like to thank um, the committee for having us today, as well as our other partners here. We're actually um, utilizing relationships actually with each one of these guys here. Um, so as far as Speedchain, we I mentioned uh, we're in the private and public sector um, delivering kind of innovative payment solutions. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the market if we step into the next slide. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that fintechs are targeting today? Some interesting stats there on the bottom. So there's you know nearly $2 billion that are stolen from companies due to business email compromise. Uh, business email compromise is when somebody um, kind of masks an email, I'm sure you guys have heard of this, where um, they're redirecting payments with ACHs and um, wired transactions. Um, so the, the FBI has estimated that at about $2 billion, um, and it's on the rise. So 78% uh, of businesses have actually experienced fraudulent attempts. So I'm, I'd, I had four last week in my email, I had a couple more on my cell phone, um, where people are trying to get you to, you know, these phishing attacks. Um, 72% of vendors have actually, or companies have actually experienced like strain on vendors from, from slow payments or um, issues with invoicing. But interestingly enough, 70% of companies are actually moving towards digital payments. So if you think about it, you've got you, this push for digital payments and digitizing services while kind of fraud is um, on the rise. So 
um, this, these are some of the problems that speed chain and fintechs are solving for. Um, one of the big ones there too is really data and payments don't, don't move together on traditional payments. So kind of the checks in the mail scenario. Um, this is another big one um, as far as kind of tra tracing the uh, transactions all the way through. So again, with the, the actual market, so you know, a survey that was done in 2022 showed that 92%, 85%, and 67% um, efficiency, reduced cost, and fraud prevention were the primary reasons why people were switching to digitizing services. And this is, this is a big driver for, again, where fintechs um, are, are pursuing you know, uh, opportunities with private sector and public. So the themes around enhanced security you'll see kind of followed through the, in the presentation. Some of the contributors for success for, for fintechs are, you know, they're solving for kind of specific problems. So where they fit in the ecosystem, um, they're creating, you know, specific solutions for businesses and overhauling kind of, you know, some of the public distribution programs. Um, really good cross-functional teams, but deep industry experience. And I've, I've bolded the one on strategic partnerships. This one's really important is they're building really kind of innovative technologies but also leveraging the services of, you know, MasterCard, FIS, um, and the rest, and, and other payment processors as well. So we are putting together those, um, you know, really good consortiums, which, which make it quite a powerful um, offering. Uh, just from a product standpoint, like leveraging, really, really quick for leveraging best practices and security um, and agile solutioning while designing kind of for future solutions. So where we are putting together um, solutions now, fintechs are also kind of aiming at the future so that, you know, as new technologies available that we're set up now to be able to deliver on those, um, those future solutions. Um, this is an, an example that just says, you know, we're, we're not pushing just on the, the payment side. We're really looking at kind of developing comprehensive service offerings. So you'll see, uh, this is an example of kind of an illustrative example of a secure data platform. You, payments is a piece of it, but you know, you've got data and analytics, advanced insights, um, the additional focus on security, and a number of other offerings that are available. Um, and again, we, we put the partnership brand on there because again, while we're leveraging good internal technologies, those things are also supported and expanded by, by those partnerships. Um, just in the, in the public sector, so fintechs are optimizing delivery for traditional payments while designing for, for the future. So this is an area, obviously, that I'm very passionate about. In, you know, an example of this is we, we distributed $1.5 billion in payments for um, a state entity over an 18-month period, but that was really optimizing the current state. So those, those, a lot of those programs are check and ACH. We are able to do that more, more effectively um, and also providing you know, data and rich payments that allowed for, you know, really tight reconciliations and also reducing fraud and pre preventing duplicates. Um, but as you move kind of towards the right, so where we're designing for the future, this is, you know, this is really exciting stuff where we're actually changing the payment modalities. So getting away from kind of check and ACH and, and getting towards more instant access um, to disbursements and digital payments that have kind of full transparency. Um, so just a really good example of this is the enhanced government disbursement cards. So um, the example we like to use on this one is a instant allocation. So picture, you know, Georgia that's, that's been struck by a tornado with like the D-SNAP and SNAP cards, um, where previously the community would have to, maybe a tornado comes through and, and takes out part of a, a town where people are now queuing in a community trying to get applications done so that they can get, um, you know, they can get their disbursements approved. Those typically would be in, in the form of a check in some cases for unbanked population, but then where do you send the checks? So this allows for new, more secure application process in your phone where you could, you could apply, you could get approved, and you get funds, a digital card sent to your phone and then funds approved same day. So um, it's really revolutionizing how payments in the disbursement world could be done. Um, and if you think about the, the fraud component of it, with better, faster um, controls and transparency, this allows you to cancel and reissue. So if there was ever an in incident where um, there was fraud that's detected, you can, you can cancel that card, reissue it, and that person can go home and, and buy groceries for their family still that night 
instead of somebody fraudulently draining their, their account, you know, and spending it in California or so. so. Um, the, the last point around this one, too, is, you know, combining some of the, the new technology as well with software on the cell phone, so empowering the actual card users to have full transparency on their phone, that they can actually monitor the spend on their phones. So the, these, in, in, you know, they can detect fraud on there as well. They could pause it securely um, and then, again, be reissued. So this is a great example, and, and a lot of this is um, built around in-house technology, um, but also leveraging some of the, the, the partnerships. So it's just a really good example of how fintechs are kind of the, the operating model for fintechs and how they fit into the, the payments world. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Just make sure I understand this. The presentation is very impressive. Are we looking at sort of a prelude to the, the issue we'll be taking up regarding the swipe cards? Is this more or less the, the swipe card fees that you all are trying to indoctrinate? Uh, it, it definitely could be. So, so this, is, this is the new um, enhanced card. So we, we're not directly um, in, in discussions on that one, but okay. this is what we're designing for and solving for those problems. It, it actually speaks to when, when, you know, we look at those specific business problems. We, we're assessing those problems with um, government distribution programs, looking at the problems of the current, but also how can we do these things better in the future. So definitely, setting up, setting up products to be able to deliver there. Is there legislation required or any of this kind of stuff that you're working on right now? No legislation required, but we're we're fully compliant with all our. Um, you know, security protocols and all of that. That's that's the foundation for which we're, we're built on. Okay. And I'm assuming that you, um, uh, is it community, I know that your community bank and then Georgia Bankers Association, same type thing. I mean, you work their standards or whatever they got there on that part of it. Um, anything else you guys like to tell us? Questions from the panel? Anybody have questions? We have a banker on here and we have, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, in terms of government involvement over the last couple of years, I know there's been, there may have been some federal things. My specific question was GDPR from Europe. I know you guys do international processing. Did that affect you guys heavily? Have you guys sort of overcome that hill? So that's, that's sort of commonplace now. What did, what did that do to you, and, and is it still affecting you negatively? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, on the – your – on your question on GDPR, yes, <laughs> it definitely impacted us. You know the uh, you know, the institution of sort of data privacy laws, kind of broadly. You know, certainly in Europe, did you know did impact obviously not only us, but but you know large numbers of, of, of you know, certainly transnational companies. And uh, you know we're obviously dealing with the privacy issue broadly in the United States. It's taken a, a very much of a state-to-state -state approach mm -hmm. at this point. Um, I mean, in the financial services world, in particular, they're already. Um, you know, strong protections under the Graham Leach Liley Act for data, you know, for financial data privacy. So I think, from that perspective, from a sector perspective, you know, um, ourselves, insurance companies, others are less maybe directly impacted, you know, by some of these new rules. I think it's sort of um, entities that are sort of out, outside that are maybe having to adapt more, you know, to the impact uh, of those those rules. And I, we see that, you know, playing out state to state. Right now, uh, as different states look at data, pri you know, data privacy uh, and sort of how to implement similar, uh, you know, s similar standards, uh, but not, you know, to cause any of the disruption that we saw with GDPR uh, and some of the negative effects. So, so I guess uh, you know, GDPR was such a big, and this is just the European data privacy standards that you guys had, had to accommodate. I guess when you, when you climbed that hill and sort of overcame that. Is everything that the state, various states have been, been wrestling with, have they all sort of been consumed within that existing framework, or is it, are there, there are things that are outside of that still? Uh, the, I guess they're sort of slightly different. I think they're approaching it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, okay. I think if anyone had to get on a, you know, the GDPR, I, I know it certainly didn't live up to its promise, I think. You know, it's, you basically get a warning about cookies on every time you go to a, Euro, a European site and you have to click, do I accept them or not? I'm not really sure what value that brings from yeah. a trans, you know, so I, I think, you know, and I think they're still dealing with some of the issues that, you know, that that legislation caused and some of the unintended consequences. I think, the, you know, to the extent that the there's been uh, advancements in the U.S., you know, Virginia, for example, um, you know, passed a law last year, I believe, 
uh, you know, dealing with this particular issue. I think they took a took a, a different approach and didn't sort of adopt some of the practices there. And, uh, and I think took a more uh, holistic, based on sort of U.S. law broadly, but also sort of existing law in particular, whether that be health laws under HIPAA, the GLBA, and sort of the fair, um, you know, sort of credit. Um, uh, not credit union, credit uh, bureau uh, laws or fair access, those sort of laws they took in, into account, I think, when crafting that. So uh, we, we haven't seen that being successful in the U.S. Uh, generally, you know, states like um, Utah uh, Virginia, uh, and Virginia, I think, are, have been sort of, I think, leaders in that realm. I think, you know, California obviously took its own approach, tried to, tried to integrate some of that, but I don't think um, other states are, are looking to follow that that particular lead, given some of the challenges uh, that they're seeing from an certainly from implementation standpoint. So hopefully yeah, that. I have a question from Senator Hodges. Actually, I've got a comment, then a question. Um, comment is that, um, I, and by the way, thank you for that excellent presentation. It's, it's not uncomplicated. Um, we have come in, in commerce, people swapping goods. We've come an, an awful long way. I mean, many, many, many years ago, people would just trade items. If somebody had a fur and they wanted food, they'd trade the fur for food. And, and then we, you know, we came upon other means of exchanges. You know, the Indians had wampum. Uh, we had gold, and then we had currencies that were based on gold, and then we had fiat currencies where people actually just would give you money and, and then you'd give them the good that they wanted. And then we came along with checks so that people could put money in the bank and they could give somebody a piece of paper without actually having to take the money out of the bank and giving it to the merchant. And now we're where we do these things electronically and digitally, and God knows where we go from here. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, when you think about what happens and how quickly it happens, if somebody wants to buy, you know, if you're, you have a bank in uh, Brunswick, Georgia, where I live, and you're in um, uh, Paris, France, and you want to buy something, you just hand them your card, and you can effect a transaction just like that. My question, does this all happen for free? Does it cost money? Do you, I mean, do you have to make money to continue to, to invest into your processes and your hardware and your software and into better systems? I, it's sort of a rhetorical question, but I think it, it's one that needs to be answered. I, I can start a little bit. I, yeah. I, I'd flip it a little bit on, um, on value delivery first. So well, I, absolutely. I look at... I look at uh, you know, and I look at the more efficient payment processes and um, and the fraud reduction and prevention that we're able to drive um, within both private and public sector. Um, you know, we we identified like ten million dollars in duplicate payments through some of these fraudulent um, or through some of these government distribution programs. So, when you weigh the the fees for some of the services versus the the value driven, it's a it's a very small percent. So. It, there, but but yes, there are there are fees that go with it. But I I, I like to always I was an operations guy before, so I um, I like to quantify the savings on those things, and and it makes it pretty glaringly clear when you can see the advance advancements in technology um, at at the value that's driven there. So the, the, fees, are the, the fees that are paid by the cardholder, the fees that are paid by the merchant, the fees that are paid. Um, I mean, they're all. It, worthwhile um, to get the system that we have. I mean, nothing that's worthwhile is free. Yeah. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. I uh, appreciate the presentation. As they said, it was a very good, very quick, very nicely done presentation. Thank you very much. We only have the room for an hour and nobody else has anything else to say. We're going to adjourn our meeting and say thank you again. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.